I'll start. Okay. Very good. Good evening, my name is Dorothy Malone, Administrative Assistant to Dr. Kelly Clenchy, Superintendent of Schools. It is 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening, August 5th. I would like to welcome you to the High School Parent Forum. Before we begin the meeting, I would like to speak on behalf of the school department the reason for having this meeting. We arranged for a public forum this evening as a means of presenting our three models of learning so that our families can have an understanding of what each model entails. After the completion of the forums in each of our schools, we will be administering a third survey to parents that will ask similar questions that were asked on the last survey. This information will be extremely helpful as we continue to look at the number of data sources that we will be used to determine which model of learning will be supported at the beginning of the school year. All school-based task forces have been creative in coming up with safe solutions to be able to educate all students for the 2021 academic school year. We truly appreciate the tremendous efforts of the educators, parents, and administrators that are members of these task forces. Please note that we will not be using the chat function during this meeting. However, we will give time for questions using the raise your hand function. If you have called in by phone, push star nine, which will also activate the raise your hand function. I will call upon the raised hands one at a time. Once called, participants should unmute, state your name and ask your question. After speaking, please return your microphone back to the muted position. Thank you, and I'd like to now open up this meeting to high school principal, John Harrington. John? Yeah, thanks, Dorothy. Good evening, everyone. Um, happy to be with you tonight to present uh, you know, the work and progress of the LHS task force. It's been a formidable task across the nation, no, no different here in Littleton. Uh, to try to plan for the reopening of schools. Specifically, I'd like to thank uh, the parents who have provided input over the last few months, as well as staff um, who are maybe who are not necessarily on the task force, but those specifically who are and are with us tonight as panelists. I want to just recognize uh, Tracy, Dr. Tracy Turner, Ms. Hillary Bridge, Mr. Keith Camo, um, Mrs. Chris Perel, uh, Mrs. Cheryl Harrington, um, and Zach Hurdle. Uh, thank you very much uh, for participating in several meetings each week over the last month to try to come up with three different models. Our task as charged by debt, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education was to come up with three models of learning for reopening schools in the fall. Uh, the first one being an in-person model, uh, an ideal model of trying to resume full activity with full occupancy. And another one where we would be in a remote model uh, where students would be uh, basically at home or at various, but not on campus. And then a hybrid model where we would have some time on campus as well as some time off campus at home uh, virtually. And we'll be going to the details of these plans uh, as the other principals have done over the previous nights um, on what it would mean at Littleton High School. Um, we also wanna acknowledge tonight that we wanna develop focus plans for special populations of students, whether they be English language learners, special education students, students with mental health concerns, students with 504s uh, plans related to um, specific um, illnesses or injuries that they need, they need support for. Um, that's one of our, we, we've discussed that intensely, intently uh, as all the schools have. And I wanted to acknowledge that at the forefront. I also wanna acknowledge that uh, it's, it's a Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided, it looks like I believe 10 days um, for schools to uh, have at the beginning of the school year for preparation and additional planning. And that is going to result in a, a reduction of time for the number of school days we have and hours we have, but it certainly is very much appreciated at this uh, pivotal time to prepare as best we can and we need the necessary days and we're grateful for that. Um, I also want to talk about key elements across the three models. Uh, you'll see throughout all the models at all the schools in the district, uh, certain themes of safety, well-being, health, sustaining connections, engagement, and learning with clear routine structure and a set schedule. You'll also see that we adopted a new schedule at the high school for four lear extended learning blocks and mods for Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. Mr. Camo, our assistant principal, will be elaborating on that shortly. All students will attend, would, in, the, in this models, will attend classes on Wednesday with an extended advisory focused on important topics, special presentations, positive school culture, relationship building, and obviously the ever important social emotional learning activities that are, 
are, that, are, that are present in schools and especially important now. Um, we will certainly adhere to all the health and safety protocols. Safety is paramount. We'll have enhanced protocols for managing staff and student attendance. And you'll see um, an in our explanation, uh, an approach to um, remote learning or even the hybrid model, if we don't have an on-campus model, where there's synchronous attendance with live Google meetings uh, and a, a very set schedule with due dates and grades. I wanted to address that right at the front because that was some of the resounding feedback we had in our parent surveys. Um, much more structure, much more routine uh, or, or set routine to, to provide uh, students with a, a model of education, whether it's remote or hybrid, that is a close replica to what we would do if we were on campus, um, as close as possible replica, I should say, uh, if we were on campus pre-COVID. Um, we'll also emphasize and enforce health and safety guidelines per the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for in-person and hybrid models. Um, and we'll, things like, you know, you've heard so much about frequent hand washing, san hand sanitizing, physical and social distancing, remote learning uh, as an option for students who are unable to return to school, face coverings and masks. Um, and this will all be elaborated on shortly as we go into the presentation. Dorothy, is it okay now to share the screen and present, present start the presentation? Okay. Thank you. Okay, folks. So to get started, we're gonna open up with the presentation of the three models and then there'll be plenty of time uh, for um, questions and answers. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And we'll certainly be taking good notes of the questions that we may need to reply to you at. Uh, in regards to at a later date. I will be calling on our panelists uh, throughout the presentation maybe to provide some insight and additional um, information that particularly relates to their areas of expertise. Um, or, you know, they also had shared a lot of uh, insights th in previous meetings and I wanted to, you know, I wanna uh, bring them forward tonight so, so they can share that with you. The first plan uh, is the draft, is a draft, and it's, I must emphasize these are all drafts. Uh, the draft plan is for an in-person learning model that we know is particularly challenging at this time with the social distancing requirements of six feet. Uh, with three feet, it's perhaps more possible in our high school campus, um, and, but it certainly would be a challenge and we would need to take some additional time to, to make that possible with that six foot uh, marker. The draft schedule is there. Uh, and Keith, I don't know if you want me to share that right now and you can just sort of explain that. Sure. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. Uh, Might want to move that into the middle of the screen, John. Yeah. Try it. It's not clicking and dragging. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can download it. Um, okay. John, you may also be able to do full screen there. Okay, full screen um, on the block sure. schedule. Let me try it again. Sorry, folks. Yeah, it's not working for me there, Kurt. Drag it over, John. Yeah, it's not clicking and dragging for some reason. I'll try to talk. But um, all right, well, as you're, if you just pull it back up, so you can see the, the side of it at least. Um, as we were thinking about developing these three plans for in-person and obviously the remote and the hybrid. One of the key ideas that we discussed was having a schedule that was gonna be able to translate easily to all three models. Um, our current seven period day um, is one that could provide some difficulty in remote learning especially. Um, and so what we tried to do with this new schedule is look at like I said, a schedule that which would translate very nicely and be able to transition very nicely to any one of the three potential models. Um, we are looking also to um, address some of the other concerns we've heard over the past year or so in terms of student feedback and student surveys, both academic stress and student workload. Um, and so one way we addressed that was by reducing the amount of mods per day um, on the majority of our, of our days. As you'll notice on the schedule provided here, there are um, longer blocks um, for the majority of the day. So our traditional seven period schedule had 49 minute blocks. What we are looking at now is having um, 
three long blocks of 98 minutes, as well as one um, more traditional block in the middle of the day, the E mod, uh, which is which would be a 50 minute block. That's the mod where we have our lunch in order to have consistency in terms of schedule for the distribution of lunch and the scheduling of lunch. We looked at having that mod meet every day. Um, so this schedule would be in effect for Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday um, in any one of our models. On Wednesdays, all of the mods would meet in a more traditional seven period day and would follow what we have been following this year as a extended advisory schedule. So we'd have a longer advisory period to begin the day um, followed by the seven blocks meeting individually for a shorter period of time, um, somewhere around 40 minutes uh, per, per class, similar to what we have done this past year on Mondays um, with our extended advisory Mondays. Okay, Keith, and I think you were able to see the schedule, right, Keith? And when I, I was able to enlarge it so yes. you could see the, modify, uh, the full screen of it. Yeah, and so, you know, as you look at the schedule again, you can see that at the top of the screen there that on Mondays and Thursdays, A, B, and G mods would meet. On Tuesdays and Fridays, C, D, and F mod would meet. Uh, and then E mod would meet every day according to the schedule in which, um, mm -hmm. you know, lunch would be scheduled around that E mod. Okay. I think it's important. We wanted to spend a lot of time up front because that's one of the most significant changes we've made. Um, and it does carry, as Keith has pointed out, across all three models. One of the things we were looking for was the synchronicity across whether we were doing remote or hybrid or on campus at some point in time so that there would be uh, that structure would be applicable throughout the school year ahead. Uh, this extent, these extended blocks do provide us with a lot of flexibility in how we would um, design learning in that time frame. It's not going to be straight up lecture. There'll be a variety of different experiences for students in that um, longer block. And with that said, I have to acknowledge that uh, there'll need to be time uh, for additional training and professional development for our staff to, you know, adjust their lesson plans to come up with um, a for, you know, adjust for the format uh, and be able to integrate different types of activities. With that said, I'd like to call on some of our teachers who are here with us today, if they wouldn't mind, no necessary order to it. Um, but I did speak to a couple before this meeting uh, to see if they would comment on how teachers might be able to optimize the, the longer block and to their advantage, um, rather than the, the typical seven period day with 49 minute blocks. Um, I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go first, Tracy, Hillary, or Cheryl. Anybody want to chime in on the block? I can go first. So um, as a teacher, I will be able to use that 98 minute block in a way that um, in particular, when we're, if we're in the hybrid and or remote setting, where I could start the class off with a, a mini lecture introduction to a topic explanation about what we're doing. And then I can send them to do some work and then we can come back and talk about the outcome of the work that they had done. By having a longer block, I can check for understanding at the end of the block, instead of them going home or doing it at home completely in a void. So it's a really a matter of thinking about how to use a 98 minute period in a way that will, um, if, if we're back full on campus and I have all the students in front of me, um, I will be able to check in with them as they're working, but if we are in a hybrid or remote situation, I will still have that opportunity to check with the students that may not be in front of me for their understanding, um, having that extra time in the block. So as an in instructor, I'm thinking about all the different ways I can use a long block to my advantage to provide uh, check-ins as well as time away from the computer to work. Yeah, and it's also important to point out that I think we, Keith may have already said this, but you know, a major reason for doing this is to minimize the transitions in the in the school day, and it puts you know students are together for a longer period of time if across the models. Um, Tracy, do you want to go next or Hillary? I was just going to chime in to mention that um, much like Cheryl was saying, the ninety eight minute blocks do actually allow us quite a bit of flexibility to be able to meet with smaller groups too. Um, it does kind of lend itself to a 30, 30, 30 minute format. Not that every teacher needs to stick to that, but in my own planning, I've thought of it a lot as a 
whole group, small group, individual work sort of situation where a teacher can present a whole group lesson and then check in with smaller groups through the breakout rooms, which is additionally another really great way that um, teachers and students can make sure that they can still collaborate. Even if we are having some students working from home while we're in person, if we're in a hybrid model, you can have students in a in classroom collaborating with students at home through the breakout room features of Google Meet. Um, and it does allow students some guided time to work through some assignments. So it seems like there'll be a lot of time for students to ask questions and to get some clarification and for teachers to group students uh, in ways that they can really get some stuff done during those 98 minute periods. So it's not definitely not going to be students sitting in front of a screen for 98 minutes. I think we would all agree that that's definitely not good teaching. I agree. Um, not sitting in front of a computer for 98 minutes is, is a, um, a nice thing about this. In terms of special education, um, the 98 minutes blocks really lends itself to helping kids with those um, longer projects that they're going to need to be doing. There's lots of paper writing, um, more difficult novels that they're talking through. And so that will not only give us time to um, focus on those more difficult assignments, but also um, even just take short breaks and really get to know kids and, and what they're dealing with and helping them sort of navigate their way through um, whatever you know plan that we have. Um, it was really nice in the spring when we had a lot of um, time with kids to, in breakout rooms were a big part of what we did as a special education department. It was really useful. Our assistants could work with kids. Um, we were able to meet the needs of our students that way. And we anticipate um, following the same model going forward. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Hillary and Cheryl. Um, and also thank you to Keith for your, you know, work in developing the schedule, um, you know, when, when we, right when we needed it, <laughs> you know, fast thinking on the, on the fly. Um, and so we're interested in gathering some feedback and making adjustments, but at this point, uh, you know, that would be the schedule we've come up with is pretty much consensus on our task force. We've all endorsed this schedule that this will work for our school um, as of September, whether we're remote, hybrid, or in person. Um, and, and Keith has already talked a little bit about the advisory schedule. We're going to have some tweaks to that. So rather than show that schedule, but it's, basic, it's basically an extended block for advisory. It's what we do already. Kids are familiar with it. We have advisories um, typically on Mondays. Uh, a 20 minute advisory will be a longer block, but it'll be on Wednesdays and we'll have all, all the good thing about the Wednesday is all classes will meet. So in the midpoint of the week, all, um, all teachers and students can connect. Uh, and that was something that would, we, we really wanted to have. With lunches uh, in person, it, locations will, will need to be determined on this. We, as we try to measure out the space, we can certainly optimize as much as possible the cafeteria and open up. So many of you are familiar with the high school, the way it's laid out with the glass partition between the hallway and the cafeteria. We could, that does slide open. And we've used that for receptions and other events. And we would do that in this case and add tables into the hall, uh, potentially as long as it was up to speed with the fire code. Um, the other thing we need to do is figure out potentially other locations on campus, uh, depending on how many students we had on campus, whether it's a hybrid model or a full in person at some point in time, um, where we would eat lunch like all schools. So that would be something we would certainly work out if this on campus model were to be enacted, uh, that we would speed uh, sooner rather than later, we would speed up that process. Um, uh, food offerings will be adjusted to, to provide individually packed to go lunches to make it a little quicker. We, we are looking at, and I think there's a meeting tomorrow about this, plexiglass type dividers that can be installed on tables to ensure compliance with safety guidelines, uh, not only just for the cafeteria and for lunch, but also throughout the campus where needed, uh, including the main office area on the counter. Um, the transportation, um, Across the board, you've already probably heard this if you've attended the other forums for the other schools. Um, healthy and sa safety protocols related to physical distancing. You're going to see a lot, hear a lot of repetition tonight. Face coverings and sanitizing will be followed. Of course, we're going to have to look at the bus passenger capacity uh, and see how we can limit that for physical distancing. Dis distancing. As an administrative team, we met this week and we talked about how buses will be cleaned between each run, each uh, school bus run uh, between the schools. Um, now there are lots, I won't get into this minutia, but I wanted to just point it out. There's a lot of details behind the scenes here and just to capture a little bit, 
we've identified if we were to go on campus, um, we would have to identify we would identify multiple we've identified multiple course uh, sections that need social distancing limitations. It would necessitate a change in location, and some of them are listed here where we could have other areas to be considered for space allocation. These are our larger spaces in the school. Um, larger classrooms from 201s of rather large classroom, the library, auditorium, the archiva, cafeteria, band room, and so on. And of course, the gym itself. We also need to acknowledge that we have to uh, figure out what to do with some office space for our school adjustment counselor, our school psychologist, and uh, therapeutic mental health counselor. Uh, Keith, I don't know if I missed anything here. We looked at, I know we're looking at potential outdoor classrooms, even uh, per perhaps acquiring some canopies where possible for the mild weather in the fall to have students outside, make some, create some makeshift uh, classrooms. Uh, maybe where we have kids, you know, I don't know if we'll have them bring their chairs, we'll provide them where they could sit out in the field even in some modified way and make use of getting some fresh air. And, and that also might enable us to provide some mass free zones with, so, with, with a, obviously a tremendous amount of social distancing where kids can feel free to take off their masks. We've all discovered how difficult it is as we've navigated these past months just in our own private lives of running errands or just going out in public of how difficult it is to have a sustained, the comfort level of wearing a mask for a long period of time. Um, so we wanna acknowledge that for students and try to give them a break where possible. Um, and I, as I've already pointed out, we'll need to adjust, alter classroom configurations, additional learning spaces and schedule changes. That's all stuff that we can accomplish. It'll just take a little bit of uh, detail work over the next month. Um, seating at this point, we measured it out for three feet apart to see if we can uh, potentially have uh, full occupancy. We know at, with the six foot marker um, that we would prefer is going to be uh, a lot more challenging. Keep in mind though, with the three foot distance, uh, that is with, according to DESE guidance, with students wearing masks. Um, but I just, so, but we're all used to hearing six feet. So we wanted to acknowledge that tonight. Um, face coverings, I've already talked a little bit about that, regardless of whether they're on campus in a hybrid model or full on campus, they're going to be required. Uh, there might be a, a special exception here and there. I think that's been a, a pointed out in the other schools due to a medical condition obviously would have to take the appropriate precautions if someone, uh, a student, or needed to remove their mask for a part of the day. Uh, face masks are required, of course, for all staff. Um, one of the questions I had over the last week was, uh, will we um, provide some training on wearing masks? Uh, will we enforce this rule? Uh, it's very important to our staff and, of course, all of us that we're doing our best to um, maintain safety for everybody on campus. Uh, face masks will be required and there'll be, pro there'll be consequences for not following, for being in compliant. Um, and that will all be communicated in advance to the SAR school. Um, and uh, the, the other thing, okay, parking. Um, some adjustments there just to try to minimize, try to create some more physical distancing between folks. We're looking at having uh, the staff at, um, we were doing, particularly looking at the middle parking lot just a couple of weeks ago until two trailers arrived to help with <laughs> uh, the storage of uh, items that we'll, we'll need to move if we're on campus to create more space in, in the, uh, with, within, the camp, within the building and the interior. Um, we'll have, obviously we have our identified bus loops. We'll really look um, that are already uh, well known. Keith, could you just share a little bit about how we uh, uh, will open up some additional doors? Yeah, um, so one of the considerations that we have for any having students on campus is trying to maintain as much distance as possible, whether we're full capacity or in a hybrid capacity. And so in order to do that, we identified four real clear entry and exit points for students. Um, for students who ride buses, the front bus loop would be their entry and exit point as has been typical for the past number of years. The upper loop near the main office would be where students who are being dropped off by a parent would enter and exit. Um, and then for, we have a lot of students who drive to campus themselves or with another student. So for students who park up in the, um, the upper lot near the field would enter th through the gym hallway. Um, this is a, a slight change from the practice in the past couple of years where they've entered near the cafeteria. And the reason for the change is that you want to be able to space out the students entering from the main door from the students entering from the, the top parking lot. So they enter near the gym hallway and then proceed to their class um, as they normally would. And the students who park in the front near the tennis courts uh, would now enter 
near the there's a ramp near the, the pump house in the exterior of the building where they would enter again that's a slight change from the past couple of years where students who parked in the front lot entered through the same door as um the students who rode buses so in order to kind of spread students out we would open up two additional doors near the pump house and near the gym to allow for um more spacing for it during entry and exit of the building I think we also discussed the having students report directly to class, right? We wouldn't have a daily yeah. advice, which we'll be talking right. about. That will move yep. things along. Like the middle school, we are also concerned about students um, traditionally hovering around their lockers and gathering in just different groups, whether they're at the lockers or not. There's going to have to be some very clear directions to the students about not only the face coverings, which I mentioned previously, and we're, we're thinking about creating a little video to just you know, show them exactly how to wear a face covering, but we're also gonna show them, perhaps we could work with um, LCTV or, you know, even I think we have some in-house uh, talent here could help us create some educational videos related to you know, proper social distancing, how not to gather and uh, congregate in spaces uh, for too long with, uh, you know, with large groups of kids and just keep it moving. Um, all that's obviously a change. Kids have been hearing lots about this over the last few months, but you know, it's when they're back on campus, they might want to fall into their old habits and understandably. So it's part of the joy of the day is to gather with your friends and, and see each other. Uh, but that's going to be something we'll need to be clear on about their transitions through the hallways. Uh, so with that said, there's a little uh, segment here about transitions, hallway traffic, passing time. We, we would, uh, like the other schools, uh, add some signage and markers on our floors and walls uh, with, with reminders about, you know, keep, keeping perhaps to one side of the hall to move quickly to your next space. We'd consider stag we will figure out a way to do this staggering passing times for classes so that we can manage the movement in the halls. Most high school hallways are notoriously crowded between classes uh, and getting kids sometimes to move along to the next class can be a challenge, uh, but it, it's really, they're going to have to move swiftly or without delay. Uh, procedures for managing student travel to the office and other locations during day, even during class time, during the mods, students sometimes need to go to the uh, guidance office. So they need to come to the main office, the nurse's office, different places. We're going to have to communicate very clear directions uh, to them about how this is done. And our teachers would be able to reinforce this as they typically do about school rules on the first day of school, about what, how they, what the expectations are. Um, uh, and we'd also you know, communicate in advance of the arrival of school. Um, consideration of limited locker use beginning at the end of the day and directed studies. We're not exactly sure how we want to manage the lockers yet. Um, some schools have prohibited their use for the time being because of the sanitation work that would be required. It's just, you know, we do have, we have to recognize the limitations of our custodial staff. So that will be something we'll update people on. Storage, I already mentioned that we added two trailers to help with the removal of items. Um, you know, I appreciate Bill Mars, our facilities manager's work on this. Uh, we're, this will allow us to create free up space in, in classrooms. Um, Gym lockers, general lockers, again, I, I think that probably is tied into the previous <laughs> uh, point I made. But cleaning and hygiene, this is something I won't, I'll go over if it's captured in the other plans that I'll present. I won't repeat it, but it, it's worth mentioning uh, because it, 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 it is um, essential. We'll provide specific directions to student staff about hand washing and hand sanitizing and you know, how to exercise proper hygiene upon arrival to school, prior to eating, prior to putting on, taking off masks, and prior to dismissal. Obviously, there'll need to be a process for how to use the restrooms and how many are allowed in there at a time. Um, where appropriate and acceptable, students can assist with maintaining clear shared, uh, cleaning uh, shared surfaces like keyboards and uh, fitness equipment if we get to a point where we can resume use of the gym and uh, workout room. Uh, we do have some high-powered Macintosh computers here that are using graphics classes, and we're going to have to come up with some cleaning profiles so students can uh, utilize the software that is on those computers, and obviously the lab benches. Um, signage with reminders, I talked a little bit about that. We are, um, I know that this will come up as a question, where, where are we at with our HVAC maintenance? That is completely under review. Um, there's been significant progress, I think, made on that already. And that has been, I think, mentioned at some previous forums, but we'll be communicating um, with the community about that uh, in the coming week or so is, is when we have an update. Um, 
The other thing we're going to have recommendation for students to bring small portable bottles of hand sanitizer, but we'll have that on hand, of course, um, readily available uh, arrangement. We will be rearranging our furniture and our desks. Um, now, as it relates to student staff and staff health, a lot of these titles of these areas of consideration that you see in bold are taken right from the DESE guidelines. And we wanted to make sure we were uh, adhering to that and addressing the different ma the major points. Of, uh, and one is uh, one area that we need to figure out with the school nurse and uh, is the isolation space near the nurse's office for students who may have be exhibiting some symptoms. As we know, a lot of kids can have in a typical school year can have cold, flu-like symptoms in the course of a day. And we don't, you know, necessarily want to rush to judgment, but we're living in a very cautious time and we need to be careful about whether it's COVID or something else. So uh, obviously educators, all of us will have a responsibility to observe and refer students who may be symptomatic to the school nurse. Um, and we'll obviously have support for those students. Um, the other thing we need to look at is it prior to the start of school uh, is identifying and supporting students and staff with underlying conditions or those who live with um, family members who have underlying conditions who need, and, and, and what type of adjustments we might need to make for them. Um, we'll also need to look at how we plan for potential leave days that can happen in the course of any given school year uh, for teachers who just need uh, time off for different personal needs. Uh, so we'll need to have a plan in place for substitute teaching. Health and safety, a lot of PPE, from what I understand, has been ordered already from the business office. Um, there'll be an inventory of masks and gloves, making sure Desi provided clear guidance on that, and we need to make sure we have adequate uh, amounts of that on hand. I know, it, I believe it has been fully ordered, and that's going to be a recurring order that we're going to have to keep up with because so many people are, are, you know, are testing the supply chain for sure. Parent-teacher conferences, when we're in person, will likely be virtual this year, um, and um, stay tuned for more updates about that. There's been some questions about club and after-school activities and athletics. Um, that remains to be seen. We do know that the MIA board has, it relates to athletics, has talked about, um, you know, starting sports. They've already voted on this no earlier than September 14th, but that's all in question of what sports would be offered, if any. Um, again, uh, moving right along to the remote model at this point, um, I'm going to turn it back to Keith and so you can hear from him a little bit about the schedule if we were in a remote model where all students are off campus um, for the, you know, with potential adjustments that I'll explain. Okay. Um, well, the actual structure of the schedule would be the same. Um, again, I'm trying to ensure as much flexibility, as much consistency as possible for remote learning, hybrid learning, in-person learning. We felt that it was really important for staff, students, families to have that consistency across all models. So even if we are in a remote model, whether to begin the year or at some point during the year, our, our start time and end time would remain consistent. Um, 7.25 start time, 1.56 end time uh, for the school day. And during a remote situation, so we're talking about now, um, students would be expected to be online with their classes, with their teachers during the scheduled time as scheduled during the, the modified block schedule, which we proposed and discussed earlier in the day. Thank you. All right. So attendance management, as it relates to the schedule, that was in definitely an area of concern uh, that surfaced in the spring. Teachers will note student attendance in Aspen for each class meeting and student atten attendance and engagement is required in live Google meetings, just as if we were in school pre-COVID. Um, so that if they're off campus, they're expected to be show up for class. Uh, they'll just be, uh, you know, remote and by live meetings. We may use Zoom here and there, but I believe we'll be using Google uh, Meetings as our primary format. John, just to quickly jump in there, as was mentioned earlier by some of the staff members, um, just because we have a 98 minute block in a remote situation will not necessarily dictate that a student would be on live class for 98 consecutive minutes for any given class. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be requirements to, to attend and engage in that class um, live, but then at the discretion of the teacher, the activities would be broken up. It wouldn't necessarily be just 98 minutes straight of sitting in front of the computer screen. I, pre I appreciate you saying that. And I think that might be a good um, you know, opportunity for one of our teachers to also chime in about you know, that when we're 
getting instruction underway. We've already talked about this in the previous model, but just to reinforce it, if anyone has any additional comments about how we're not going to, we really want to be sensitive to that amount of time on a screen if you're remote. <laughs> Uh, right. hybrid model. Does anybody else want to chime in on that just to reinforce that message? Yeah, John, so uh, um, to, to reiterate, again, uh, as an instructor, I don't anticipate, I anticipate being available to my class for the 98 minutes, but your student will come on every day and they're at the start of the block with me and to receive, uh, maybe it's a short lecture, uh, explanation about what the content is, um, specific instruction may break them up into small groups, may send them off, they, they log off. I'm looking at some digital tools to help students come back before the end of the um, class period so that they know to check back in with me uh, so I can check on progress. Uh, as uh, Tracy had mentioned, breaking up that uh, my class into smaller groups and meeting with them 15 to 20 minutes in a small group setting. So the students would be off doing something off um, computer and then come back for a, a small group meeting with me, uh, perhaps even one-on-ones. I can anticipate uh, some of the classes that do a lot more writing, doing one-on-one -on -one meetings to cover a piece of writing with a student. Um, so we are anticipating not spending, having the students sit in front of their computer for the entire 98 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but they will check in with each teacher every class period. Right, I appreciate you saying that because that's, it's, I think that's gonna be very important for parents and students to hear that it might be a brief introduction, it might be given that, like as Hillary had pointed out, the 30, 30, 30, um, we, there's a segment of lessons or you're gonna go away for a little bit and you're gonna report back, go, go do this offline and <laughs> at home uh, for a, a little while and then come back. Um, so it, we have flexibility here is what I'm emphasizing. I'm going to start to pick it up a little bit because some of these things are going to be repetitive here. And we mentioned the weekly advisory model. Again, we're talking about the remote learning model where uh, all of our students are off campus. Um, and then uh, this applies to the remote learning model, similar to what the middle school came up with in terms of student responsibilities and school work completion. I think this is also in the Russell Street uh, model. As typical in school, assigned school work is required. I want to get at the heart of what a lot this is. A lot of these, um, when we get into the responsibilities and expectations for students and staff, we're going. I think a lot of our parents will find that we're responsive to the feedback in the surveys when they when they see these points. Um, students are expected to fully participate in complete class activities and assignments. Specific course content will be provided by teachers with due dates. Students will email post assignments according to directions of, of their teacher. Uh, students will receive feedback for assignments in traditional class grades. As they typically do, students should of course review their assignments and create a schedule. And that's just sort of some good advice there so that they can complete their assignments by a due date. And there'll be a handbook-like document that um, we'd like to create to have parents and students sign an agreement about understanding and complying with remote learning rules and expectations and the live Google me meeting Zoom attendance requirements because there are grades attached to, to their performance here. And we wanna make sure that everybody understood exactly what was expected of them um, be before we get underway with this model. Uh, with educator expectations and responsibilities, just I'll be brief about this, but teachers will provide synchronous and asynchronous class activities and assignments. Teachers will design opportunities, obviously a variety of different uh, opportunities for students to learn with breaks. Um, and as a routine, uh, classes with live Google meetings will occur according to an assigned LHS schedule. Um, teachers may have access to teach from their classrooms on the LHS campus. And that's just a mention of that teachers will have time to prepare their lessons each day. Um, communication protocols and procedures, again, responsive to feedback. Teachers will maintain connections with students via email, Google Classroom, Google Meet, and Zoom. Administra administrators will meet uh, we'll continue weekly communication with teachers and parents. All assignments will be posted in grade and Aspen grading portal and uh, virtual. We'll also, Keith and I will be working on creating some virtual principal round tables for parent meetings as we go along. So we can, in, you know, have formative feedback and discussions with, with parents if we're in a remote model 
to be responsive so that we're not waiting around too long if something comes up as a major issue and, and parents would like to meet with us. Some of these virtual meetings will also have, will be topic focused, um, similar to what we do with the principal's coffees in the past. Um, there'll be virtual class meetings and guidance uh, department seminars and presentations. I know a lot of parents of juniors in particular and the incoming senior class will, uh, are concerned about the, the guidance seminars and they will be provided as well. I talked to Mr. Christie just briefly about that today. Uh, principal forums, informational updates, guest speakers, presentations, we're gonna strengthen our partnership with LCTV. We're very grateful for their help with so much um, over the last few weeks, whether it's graduation or these parent forums. And I think that we'll see a real expansion of our partnership with them. As, as it relates to assessment practices and grading procedures, um, as with typical school procedures, teachers will provide beneficial formative feedback and numeric letter grades for student growth and learning. And then there's a list of um, some of the, how the grading criteria will be provided for each course and assignment as we typically do. Uh, again, you're gonna see uh, parents and students should see a real contrast between some of our very lenient, flexible spring practices uh, when everything was sort of thrust upon us and we had to adjust rapidly. Now we'll see um, much more structure and, and more of a, a replica of what we would ordinarily do. Grades will also re uh, be reported to parents as typical with midterm progress reports and quarterly marking periods. Specific procedures for tests, quizzes, and mid-year and final exams remain under review, but will be explained to students upon uh, the start of school. Uh, labs, demonstrations, specialized hands-on activities. We got some questions from uh, parents about how can we optimize the lab experience, if at all possible, could we do it in person, during, even during a remote experience? We'll have to see what uh, the public health guidelines are about this, where we make exceptions to have students come in and do a particular activity, whether it's a physical education activity. I've had parents talk to me about that. Uh, whether it's a music, individual music or a small group music lesson with Mrs. Bridge. Uh, I know she's amenable to it, uh, but the, the question is, you know, how do we make those exceptions and, and make sure that we're following all the protocols if we're in a remote model? And there's a list of some other classes that, that applies to. As it relates to special education, I don't know if, um, you know, I could turn it over to Mr. Komodo to get us started here. Uh, I'll take a break here from talking and then uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Turner or Mr. Hurdle would like to chime in about special education and related service, related services. Sure. Um, so in a remote learning situation, one thing that we obviously have to focus on is how do we provide the services required by IEPs and 504s and for ELL students as well. And so in order to address that in a remote situation, the teachers or ed assistants who are typically scheduled to be in inclusion class sections would be part of those Google meetings, those live meetings that are occurring as part of a, um, a class meeting or a breakout session, a breakout room, you know, to provide students with either individual support, small group support, whatever is appropriate based on the IEP needs of each um, individual student. The curriculum skills courses, which students are scheduled into as they would be during a regular typical school year, they would meet as typical and as scheduled during the regular mod. If it's say a BMOD curriculum skills period, the student would, would log on to their BMOD curriculum skills class and the teacher would break down the class as they felt necessary. Our general ed teachers would collaborate with special ed teachers um, and aides or service providers to make the necessary modifications or accommodations for students and IEPs. Um, we have to look at whether or not we can prioritize in-person delivery of service in a remote model for speech or PT or OT um, as you know, appropriate with the, the safety protocols that would, would need to be in place. Um, and this is something we've done this past year during our remote learning, the special education teachers did still meet with their students. They still met with their curriculum skills classes. They still met individually with students to help support them in their general ed classes. Um, and so before I finish with the rest of the bullet points, either you know Tracy or Zach, you wanna jump in and just explain a little bit about that experience this past year going forward. Sure, I'm gonna start and Zach's gonna jump in. Um, so, 
we ran our curriculum skills classes like we typically do. And what we did is we'd meet um, as a whole class for curriculum skills with our assistants who are typically with us during those mods. And then we put students into breakout rooms because especially at the high school, we have different grade levels. And even within the same grade level, kids have different needs. They have different IEP goals. So if someone needs help with math, then they're not really going to partner with a kid who needs help with, you know, a history paper. So we had breakout rooms where students basically worked one-on-one -on -one with either me or one of my assistants. And I um, would jump in and um, also be a part of all the sessions so I could see what kids were doing. My colleagues, um, Zach, Jen, um, they did the same thing. So our, our special education services in the spring were pretty robust and we plan to continue that. One of the things that I was thinking about that came up in our meeting, um, our high school meeting yesterday was how we could, um, as we special education teachers still support inclusion classes, I was thinking that it might be um, worth it for us, and it's pretty easy to do, um, set up a breakout room where kids on IEPs, even though they're in an inclusion class, um, they may not want to say, hey, I have a question from Mr. Hurdle, um, where they could put in the chat in a breakout room. It's like, you know, we keep the mics off. It's a technology thing. It's, the kids are pretty used to it by now. But they could put in the chat in the other room, uh, Mr. Hurdle, I have a question for you. And then Zach could um, go and work with that kid individually so that um, there wouldn't be an issue with them trying to ask a question in front of the whole class. With our classes, kids know each other. Confidentiality that way is not an issue, having more than one kid in a breakout room because they're in curriculum skills together. So they know each other. Um, so we could potentially have four or five kids in that breakout room using the chat to ask Zach or Jen or whoever questions about what they're working on within the class with their general education teacher. Zach, you want to add anything to that? Yes, uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, Zach Hurdle here, Special Education Department. Um, there's just two things I, I would like to roll out is that the way we're going to plan on implementing Mr. Camo's schedule, it's across modes. So it doesn't matter if we're remote or in the building, that schedule will remain in place. So we will be able to see students on IEPs on a regular basis. We'll be able to provide those services that, that are outlined you know, in their plans. One other thing I just would like to clarify is that even though in this proposed schedule change, we're, we're switching from uh, seven periods a day to four, the number of minutes that are framed on your student's service delivery grid changes just by like two minutes and they're actually gaining service. So if you were concerned that your child might not be receiving you know, the same number of minutes, uh, that was definitely something that we have reviewed thoroughly, and uh, I'm happy to address that uh, via email, zhurdle at littletonps.org, and um, I'm happy to uh, feel any questions that you have. Thank, Thank you. you. Back to Keith. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Zach and Tracy. Uh, Keith, did you we're moving, moving along, do you have anything else you want to add? I just I wanted to just chime in that um, you know, we're going to try to have special education evaluations that come up. Um, and new evaluations in person with safety protocols as much as possible with the school psychologist or whoever's conducting the evaluation. Protocols will be developed for in-person counseling sessions as well for mental health support. Um, IEP meetings, um, I think we'd all love to have those in person with safety protocols if we could. Uh, there, there might be some adjustments. We'll have to look at DESE guidance on that to conduct them virtually as needed. Uh, but I just wanted to chime in on those last few things. Keith, is that covered for special education at this point? For now, yes. Okay. And then ELL, uh, we'll be working out some plans and that, that, that's actually, I think I have a couple of bullets about that later on uh, as we work with Mrs. Pettengill on that. Um, rules for students in Google meetings and Zoom sessions. If we're remote, we're going to have to update our handbook a little bit uh, because we do have sometimes at, at the high school or in uh, some immature or inappropriate behavior and we have to address that when it, as it comes up. So there'll be a responsible use of technology policy that Will be applied to uh, remote learning and online participation. Also, we have to be mindful of academic integrity requirements and they'll be communicated and reinforced. Um, and there'll be specific, one, it is a list of some things that some other schools are doing related to uh, live Google meetings or Zoom meetings, you know, muting your microphone um, at, as, you know, and, and waiting your turn, that kind of thing to speak. Um, so 
professional development. Uh, for this remote learning model, we have to acknowledge that we're going to have to provide time for training and workshops, about, whether it's about instructional technology and teaching in longer blocks. And a shout out and thank you to the tech department for already initiating that process. Uh, they've been, you know, they were certainly quite strong throughout the spring in offering things to our staff across the district, and they've continued that in the summer. I already mentioned about parent-teacher conferences, what we would do there. That remains a bit under review, but they certainly could be scheduled virtually. Um, Technology resources and needs for remote learning. We'll have to identify and support teachers and students who have, you know, may have some needed resources uh, to optimize their remote learning experience. And we'll work on that. Uh, we'll be surveying new students and who may have been either school choice or moved into town about their technology needs to make sure they're taken care of uh, and continue to distribute the needed materials. There'll also be, a, uh, we'll be looking at how we use online textbooks uh, and seeing what classes that applies to. Now, moving right along, you're gonna, we've already talked about the in-person model. We've talked about um, you know, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the remote model, and we're now looking at a hybrid model where we combine that. And I'm gonna again, turn it over to Keith uh, because Keith was instrumental in developing the schedule and to explain how the different groups of students uh, would be divided up by mod and what days. That, we've already kind of said this at the beginning, but I'd like to just have him recap this and then we'll move a little bit more briskly through this model. Okay, um, so if we are in a hybrid model, as of right now, we divide the student body into groups, identified here as group A and group B. And so with the hybrid model, group A, which would be roughly half the student population, would attend in person on Mondays and Tuesdays, would be remote learning on Thursdays and Fridays. Group B would attend in person on Thursdays and Fridays and remotely on Mondays and, and Tuesdays. Uh, and then all students would attend class remotely on Wednesdays. Wednesday would be the, a day that we would, you know, already dedicate to the deep, deep cleaning of the building to, um, I guess, minimize the crossover of the two cohorts of, of students and minimize the interaction of those two cohorts. Um, so each student, because of the, the different schedule and the, the modified block that we're looking at, each student would be um, able to see all of their classes in person either the Monday or Tuesday or the Thursday, Friday, um, once per week and then twice per week remotely, there would be each of those classes. Thanks, Keith. And then moving right along, we've already talked about a daily advisory that would not be offered if uh, for days the kids were on campus. Um, uh, the attendance would be taking in, in, the, in the mod, the first class. Weekly advisory meeting though would continue on Wednesdays. Attendance management has already been discussed. Lunch would have to be designed um, differently for sure in a hybrid model where we had students on campus. Um, we have determined that Keith was, I think was able to do this with some of the custodial staff and, the, uh, and facilities people to, to figure out exactly how we could do um, lunch in the CAF with, with, with half occupancy, Keith, is that right? Yeah, in the hybrid model with half occupancy with three lunches as we've had scheduled for the past couple of years, um, our cafeteria has the capacity along with a, a adjoining hallway to accommodate one third of half of the students per lunch. Um, we would Three still need plexiglass dividers at tables in order to maximize the capacity of those tables. Um, but there wouldn't be the need to seek out alternative dining areas um, in a hybrid model. We'll be able to, we, we'd be having uh, three lunches to make that possible too. Yes. All right, so again, I've already talked about this, so I won't read it all to you folks again, uh, but there are student responsibilities and schoolwork completion in the hybrid model that apply in the remote model. And I wanted to emphasize this here. This was a, for our initial, this will clean up our presentation and, some, and consolidate it better for future presentations. But we wanted to make sure these were discrete plans that we presented at different times. And then, you know, we brought it all together here tonight. Uh, for your review. But a lot of the same things that apply in the remote model, of course, here apply in the, uh, you know, in our hybrid approach uh, in terms of how, what, what are the expectations of students, particularly when they're off campus. Um, and so you'll see the same areas, same categories that needed to be addressed. And this was from a prior presentation to our district uh, task force. But these categories related to communication protocols that you've already heard about tonight assessment practices and grading procedures, special education and related service guidance that uh, we went into some uh, detail with, with, with other members of the panelists. So thank you for that. The all guidance, I just want to go back and touch upon that. will be provided as typically scheduled 
uh, when we're on campus. And we'll plan to connect with um, Mrs. Pettengill, who's our expert in this area, to develop specific service delivery to identified students. Um, and we'd like to prioritize in-person service and support where possible. And again, rules for Google meetings and Zoom sessions. Again, the importance of professional development. Coming back to the parent-teacher conferences, you can see the model is, you see a lot of synchronicity across the models where we're doing the same thing. Uh, room usage and adjustments. Um, Keith, I don't know if you want to just briefly talk about this. I think it's, we already covered it, uh, but we, yeah. feel, we feel like in a hybrid, right, with half the capacity, half, half the students here, roughly, it could be less than that, uh, that we would have, um, we could keep uh, students in classrooms with six feet of distance, which is different from the full on campus model. Right. Yeah, so the, the thing to note here is that in the previous you know, conversation about fully on campus, we talked about three feet of distance with masks. In a hybrid situation, we'd be looking at six feet of distance between desks, um, you know, with students wearing face covering still. And so with our typical classroom size, at three feet, we're at 18 students. At six feet, we're at 13 students. And so with our, you know, our current schedule and our, our current um, build for next year, the majority of our classes at half capacity would be able to fit in the room that they're allocated to currently. There's one or two sections that we have to move to a larger space, but it's nothing that um, causes any concern. Okay, great. Thank you, Keith. And again, face coverings, we already covered that, parking, transitions, you'll see this is all similar stuff across the models. The emphasis on cleaning and hygiene, student and staff health, health and safety, PPE considerations, Again, we're not sure exactly what we're going to do yet with the clubs and after-school activities. Of course, we want to have them, uh, and we'll try to figure that out. Athletics, still a question, um, and I've already talked about the, the, the need and you know, desire for training related to simul simultaneously teaching students in person remotely in a hybrid model. That's an area of growth for a lot of us, and we would need to make sure we're, provide, we're, we're providing the necessary support for staff. Um, and we'll also need to be determining any technology needs to facilitate this hybrid model. Um, and that's all that process is underway. I have a list of questions here um, that some people have sent in and um, I can get to them. Uh, I was able to cut and paste some of them from emails. I wasn't able to get to all of them, but I did uh, cut and paste a few of them. So before I do that though, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if that's okay with you, Dorothy, and turn it over to you. Again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you for all your hard work leading up to tonight's presentation. And um, I think we're ready to go. I think I stopped sharing, right? <laughs> hey, you okay. did a great job, John. Thank you. Okay. Uh, not sure why I'm not seeing hands. Okay. There we go. Okay, Julie Anderson, um, I have to promote you to the panel. You can shut your camera off. And Dorothy, I do, I do have questions for folks if, uh, if, we need, if we have any technical glitches, I can address some of them. That we're I don't know, what, can you hear me? Oh, you. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I'm on video. Um, you are on video. Just I am. Okay. Yes. Um, I was wondering um, how they're going to group like the students. Are they going to do it alphabetically so that the kids that are home, um, you know, if we have a younger sibling, that they could be home together. If uh, if you have a high school student and a younger student, you know, like in another grade, like in middle school or elementary school, if those kids will be um, grouped together, maybe they could do alphabetical that way. That you know, the kids in Russell Street can be home with their older sibling. Right. Hi, Julie. Um, yes, that question came up, and I know that Keith might be able to answer that right off the top of his head. Yeah, so the, the plan right now is to divide students alphabetically um, to ensure that, like you're talking about, students who are in the high school and Russell Street um, would be home or in, uh, in person on the same days. Um, there would be consideration given to students who have different last names who share the same household. Um, so there would be individual cases addressed to adjust cohorts, but typically we're looking at a alphabetical adjustment. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for all your hard work.
Okay. A, you can ask your question. Your name, please. And you need to unmute, please. Thank you. Um, this is Anna Vaka. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. I have uh, two questions. One is um, if the lecture portion of the classroom will be recorded, regardless of what model, well, I mean, if there's a remote or hybrid such that a student can review it later, if they have any questions for clarification, that's one question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, will there be a remote only option for parents who opt to stay, keep their children home despite, for example, an in-person uh, mm -hmm. model? I'll take I'll take a, um, a shot at that question. I think to, to start with the, your second question, we are the SC's guidance is pretty clear providing remote options, uh, even if we are on campus or in a hybrid model. But parents, for because particularly relating to medical issues, uh, have want to keep their student home through a remote model. Uh, that is an option that is available. Yeah. Okay. And the the first question, could you just repeat repeat it again? The, Sure. Uh, will, for for example, during the live teaching, so I have three children yeah. at three different schools. Oh, so the to recording, yeah, the recording, right. yeah, that's <laughs> that we're going to have to work out. So, so a lot of these things, because of our changing and working conditions here, um, a lot of this stuff will be negotiated with the teachers association. Um, but I, I do know that some teachers in the spring did record lessons, particularly uh, lecture portions were quite comfortable with that. That would be something that would we, we would work out in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Penny McCabe. Hi, this is actually James McCabe. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so just wanna reiterate, thank you guys so much for taking the time to do this meeting and for all of the work that has uh, gone into this so far. Uh, we're curious if teachers will be using the same platform and, and using it in consistent ways to assign the classwork, uh, or if it'll be uh, a, a variant uh, approach like, uh, like it was in the spring where some people use Zoom and some people use di different uh, uh, Google Classroom differently and some people used email, et cetera. Yeah, James, appreciate the question. It's a, it's a common question that's come up in even just an email today. Um, we know that from the, this past spring, a lot of teachers who are not familiar or comfortable with using Google Classroom are now comfortable and, and very familiar with using Google Classroom. And, um, and we're still figuring that piece out, though. A lot of these things, as they re relate to some specific adjustments in practice, um, are going to be things that will work out with the association and the teachers uh, you know, as we move ahead in the coming weeks. I would, uh, we certainly understand the, the need for... Um, you know, to have some type of central platform for parents to be able to see the assi posting of assignments. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to best do this so that we can uh, cut down on the, the confusion that people are experiencing trying to navigate so many different ways of being communicated with seven, in some cases, six, seven teachers, whether the teachers are setting, posting their assignments by email or they post it on a different, on a, their favorite website. How can we um, figure that out is going to be one of the challenges we're going to try to resolve in the next week or two. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's more for um, the, the students uh, than, uh, than us as parents, uh, at least in, in my asking yeah. of the question. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was hard. Uh, I know it was hard for everyone. But um, thanks again. Stay healthy. You're welcome. You too. <laughs> Please ask a question. Hi, um, thank you guys for all your work. Um, I asked the same question last night at the middle school presentation. So uh, apologies to all of you on the panel that have already heard this. Um, I am thinking that my, my questions are about the hybrid model, um, you know, for consideration. Um, I'm gonna have a really low tolerance for, uh, you know, my son having symptoms and me saying, you know what, today's just not the day for you to go to school. You've got a brand new cough or, you know, you've got a, a low grade fever. You're staying home today, even if, you know, it, it, the rest of the day he turns out absolutely fine. He's able to do uh, some work. So will there be a possibility for him to be able to 
um, you know, I call in, tell tell the the front office, you know what, he's not coming in, but he'd like to to continue to do work today remotely. Is that going to be uh, an available option to him? Um, yeah, I, I can speak to that, Julie, and maybe Chris Burrell will want to comment to our school nurse. But uh, you know, the expression that's working its way around is, "If you're sick, stay home," right? And um, that's we see that posted in different places. So if he's not feeling well, uh, it, it, we, as a precaution, you know, whether it's just a runny, you know, he's just headache, just typical, you know, illness, he should be home. Is that what you know? That does that get to your question? Well, no, I mean, obviously, if, if, if he's not feeling well, you know, uh, I'm not going to send him into school. But I guess, because my threshold, you know, there are times when yeah, he wakes up in the morning, and he's like, Oh, I'm just still so tired, I don't feel good. And you just go, you know what, deal with it, you're, you're probably fine, go to school. But my threshold for that is going to be a lot lower. So I'm going to say, you know what, no, you've got to stay home today. But if we looked at like all the possibilities for for him to be sick, it's like he may have 10, 15, 20 days where he's just borderline and I choose to keep him home. Um, so so yeah. is he going to be able to do something remotely and not have 10, 20, 50, you know, absences as I'm trying to yeah. make sure he, he isn't I, one of those barely symptomatic spreaders? Yeah, I'm going to, Keith wants to, I think, get in here. We did discuss this in our our meeting actually this I think of this past week or the week before the scenario where um, you can just activate the remote model if you're just under the weather and you, you know there's no reason for a kid necessarily to miss Keith you want to comment on that yeah I was gonna say that's kind of that's kind of the beauty of having the consistent schedule for all of our models is that in the event that a, you know a student isn't feeling well they don't necessarily have to be absent that day from school they can still chime in or zoom in or whatever you want to call it from, from home and be part of the class and participate and get all the instructions and still do all the group work or activities that are happening in the classroom from home. Um, right. And that's largely the reason why we wanted to have that same consistent schedule. That way students who are home would have no real need to miss anything that's happening during the class period. Appreciate that. And Jennifer, it's a great question because I think it will alleviate a lot of concerns from parents that if you, if you just under the weather, you don't feel, you don't have it. You know, a lot of kids are dealing with stress just aside from COVID or just, you know, just something just not right with them that day. They don't necessarily, they, but they'll engage in class and participate. They just don't want to go to the building. They'll, that, they'll be counted as present. That will not be an absence if they are engaged that day. John, can I just add as an, a teacher, one of the great things about the hybrid model is that even though I have a group of students at home, they are participating from home. So if a student who is supposed to be in class is now home because they have symptoms that are suspicious, they just join as though they were part of the group that was at home to begin with. Both of the cohorts will be doing the exact same thing every day, uh, but half will be at home and half will be in the classroom. So yeah, they, it absolutely lends itself to uh, being extra cautious about sending your child to school because they do not need to miss school. As long as they log in, they'll be counted as attending the class. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, uh, following along um, just on that topic really quick. If we decided as a family to, you know, let's say you guys all decide hybrid models the way to go or, or whatever, and we decide we want to keep him home, um, is there an option at some point during the course of the year to be able to say, you know what, they've really got this going great. We really would like to get them back into the classroom or vice versa. Um, uh, is there going to be an opportunity to switch what our choice is um, at some point during the year? I do know that this question has come up at the other schools. And one of the things I think they're looking for is some type of commitment. Maybe they might say it as a, a trimester, but uh, for us, it would be a quarter of the year. But you know, we, we would evaluate each case as it came up. We obviously are the priority, both from the Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education and our priorities to have to maximize in-person education as safely as possible. So we know the benefits of that. If there's any way we can help to facilitate that and expedite that in a quicker way, we'd rather have him on campus. Um, so 
we'll have we'll have we'll come up with some clear guidance about when that would be possible if you chose remote and then you had second thoughts about it uh, mid October you know when, right when the midterm progress reports go and you're feeling com more comfortable and more at ease um, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll address that question thoughtfully and provide a, a very set response for all parents and kids that's perfect thank you guys so much Cami Bean, your question, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, and thank you all. I just want to echo all the positive things everyone's been saying. I know this is a really hard transition for all of us. Um, this may be a little out of scope for this, but um, well, actually, one to follow on to the last question. What about teachers? Will they get to work from home remotely? Because obviously, we're, you know, teachers are going to be, we're all in that target age category, right? So concerned about your health and will you have that option to work remotely? Um, and then secondly, and this is the part that may be out of scope, is is what is the data that we're taking into account when determining if we're going from remote to hybrid or hybrid back to face-to-face? -face? What's that point? When, and, and, and that might be board of health decision or the state decision. Um, and then part of that too is just how is the school tracking and reporting back on any COVID cases? Like if we find out that there's a student who's tested positive in my child's class on that day, will I find out? Um, and then what will happen? Okay. Uh, well, a lot of these questions that you have are district-wide questions because they apply to all schools, like particularly as it relates to the, what would the expectations be for teachers and what will the, be the exceptions if they need to stay home because of their own uh, health risk and concerns. Um, so that's all going to be worked out district wide in the in the coming weeks. Uh, I would also uh, think that if there was a COVID case, there would be clear there will be a clear communication protocol for us to follow in alerting anyone, particularly who came into contact with that student, uh, about the situation while trying to also respect and honor, you know, the privacy of hip, you know, health. Um, health records and that kind of thing. But we, this is a different time we're living in right now. So we would definitely want to send out some type of alert if someone was at risk and there was a positive case uh, at the school. Uh, some of the, you know, a lot of the things that you talked about though will have to be, um, you know, figured out at a district level uh, with, with the teachers association um, as well as the school committee. The Board of Health will ultimately uh, advise us, I, I imagine, as well as medical professionals on what those trends, all schools have that challenging question uh, to, to, to answer, is at what point do you, you know, decide to go from uh, remote to hybrid or back, toggle back and forth based on uh, changing data uh, and cases in the uh, community or in the region, that stuff that will get, a, uh, all that will be addressed with uh, healthcare, health professionals. You all set, Cami? Oh yeah. I so, sorry. I thought I thought you had muted me, but I had muted myself. Um, I do have one other sort of follow up question, which is really about curriculum. So, um, I have a freshman coming in. So high school is all new to us. Um, you know, she had particular concerns with um, algebra last year. Like they really didn't finish the curriculum. What are the plans to kind of help students get caught up that way? I feel like there's going to be some backtracking from last year. I heard a lot of comments from there throughout the spring, even early on from the math department uh, with this specific concern about how, how they were going to plan for the month of September to sort of make up for lost learning uh, that happened in the spring uh, and how to, you know, br bring uh, students up to speed and get them ready for, to tackle the curriculum. I, I, I would think they'll do a fair amount of pre-assessment right from the get-go find out where students are at in different places and try to meet the students where they are to get them where they need to be. Um, that's sort of a, you know, sort of a general way of answering a question. I have a lot of confidence in all of our math teachers. It's quite a talented uh, group of uh, teachers. And, uh, and I think they've been thinking um, a lot about this exact question and how they're going to respond to it. Okay, great. So we can assure our students that they'll, they'll get caught up and, and figure that all out. Thank you. I have no more questions at this point. I appreciate it. I have phone number 3585. Please ask your question. Last four digits. Hi, thank you very much. This is Jackie Farrell. My question is about the facility. Will Littleton High School have exclusive use of the entire building for the year or are we still renting out space 
to outside groups while the school year is in progress. Hi, Jackie. I, this is John. I appreciate the question. Um, you know, that's, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. At this point in time, uh, given all the concerns about sanitizing, you know, sanitizing, cleaning the building, um, we don't envision that in the near future. That's going to be something we're going to have to resolve at the district level with the business office, with Mike Deneau, you know Mike pretty well, um, who oversee, you know, helps to um, supervise our theater and schedule bookings and things like that. It also goes, it also relates to the other state guidance about public gatherings and what size you can have um, in, in, for, for various um, events. Um, as you know, our auditorium can hold over, well over 400 people, maybe over 500 people. Uh, so uh, that's a lot of people. Uh, and you can imagine that there'll be a prohibition about that for the time being. And uh, I would expect if anything's gonna change in that area, uh, Jackie, uh, we'll be sure to alert people of what 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 the exceptions are and for what type of events, if they were you know and, and when, when that's going to come about. Absolutely, we'd love to be able. We all want some sense of normalcy and be able to resume um, regular activities here at the high school, whether it's the Littleton Lyceum coming in to use the event, Indian Hill, uh, use the venue, or Indian Hill. But at, for the time being, I can't see where we're wrestling so much about just how to open school. I can't see that uh, as a, a possibility. Uh, in the near future for now. That's great to hear. Thank you. Okay. May Mack, your question, please. Hi, you can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am concerned about um, the social distancing. So for the students, we will be have lunch in cafeteria. So will there be any social distancing like three feet or six feet apart? Or, and also the plexic glass, how would they be installed in the cafeteria? I, I'll let Mr. Kamo talk more about the plexiglass and he was part of an earlier conversation about that and who knows how, that would, how we're looking at installing it. It hasn't been completely determined yet, eh? uh, but we, are, we will have six foot uh, social distancing uh, for the most part, there might be, I don't know if the DESI guidance allows for three feet with, um, with masks, but obviously the masks are off while you're eating, so it has to be six feet. Um, so there'll be six foot of distance for the students to be seated at. We can, we'll, uh, the less per table. Uh, we'll be looking at the measurements of the table and to see how many we could actually have at, at, at round tables and our rectangular tables. But Keith, do you I want to talk about that? Talk that directly, John. Um, so in our cafeteria, we do have right at this point twenty round tables. Um, they're five feet and five feet across. So in order to have more than one student per table, we would need the plexiglass uh, or some sort of divider to allow more than one student per table. We also have long tables, which we would be able to space out. Um, they're they're long when they're together. They're actually individual tables that we'd have can accommodate sixteen more students. Um, the reason why we're looking at using the hallway next to the cafeteria is just for that purpose of spreading, spreading kids out to six feet, um, and adding capacity to our, our cafeteria by using, utilizing the space right next to it. So there would be um, six feet of distance required um, for use of the cafeteria for all students and the plexiglass would be installed in order to increase the capacity um, of our tables individually. I, I've worked on this with um, our custodial staff to kind of measure out and plan out the configuration of the cafeteria. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, man. Rob Little, ask your question, please. Yeah, thank you. And I, again, echo what the other speakers have, or the callers have said about uh, the, all the hard work you guys are putting into this. Two comments, really, or two questions. If you're in one of the two remote learning modes, um, how do you plan on handling things like science labs? Or I think you alluded to this earlier, the, you know, the computer graphics would take a little bit more high power to, uh, computer. Uh, computer power through Wi-Fi and whatnot. Can you speak to that a little bit? I can, yeah. So de the Department of Ed has issued guidance specific to labs and um, it, it's a uh, supplemental information for courses and laboratory work and how we can go about doing that in a safest way possible. In the remote model, um, you know, it is, it's hard to do it if the kids aren't here, right? So uh, we, I'm wondering if there's an allowance we could have for certain kids to come in at certain times uh, even in a remote model. I don't know what uh, this would be feasible uh, where they could come in 
um, and and participate in some type of activity that was really important to do hands on. There are other classes that would would also benefit from that from time to time in a remote model. In a hybrid model, it's obviously less of an issue. Um, uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Harrington's here. She's a, one of our most experienced science teachers in the building. I don't know if she wants to comment on how she would conduct labs uh, remotely. Right. So right now, we have for a remote model, we have a couple of options. There are some virtual labs that I used in the spring that the students actually do the technique and they gather data and then they're able to analyze the data. Um, that doesn't cover all the labs that we typically do in the life sciences, and I'm not sure what uh, chemistry has to offer. So uh, the plan is, if we are remote, to do demonstrations and to have those demonstrations video streamed live or um, do the demonstration. Of course, you know, being science, you want to make sure it comes out right. So do the experiment and record it and then have the students access it. Um, guiding them along the way to say making a hypothesis and um, gathering the data and then analyzing the data so that the thing they'll miss is the hands on manual dexterity skills that we normally try to develop in the students. We will still have as best we can replicating the lab experience, but given limitations on equipment, we don't have it, we do some pretty advanced. Um, biotechnology techniques in the life sciences, and we just don't have enough pieces of equipment for each student to have their own. So we'll have to demonstrate those labs, but any labs that we have enough, say beakers or pipettes or you know individual, we um, would be able to do the labs hands-on in the hybrid model uh, with students you know, here in the class. Does that help answer your question? Absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and the second question is completely unrelated. Um, maybe it's more of a district wide one. With regard to sports schedules, has any consideration been given either at the school or at the districts, as far as you know, to shifting around the sports schedule for the non contact sports to be all sort of, sort of shuffled into the fall, you know, and then see how things play out over the course of the winter and maybe open up more in the spring? Uh, Rob, I could comment briefly on that. That's a definitely a you know a regional decision or a statewide decision as it relates to moving of sports, particularly those sports that have tournament play. I know that area athletic directors are discussing that, but there's been no decision made as, as of now. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all I had. Appreciate your work. John, it's seven twenty-two. We have one more question. Should we consider this the last question? Sure, thanks, Dorothy. Mueller, ask your question, please. Hi, I just want to, can you maybe elaborate a little bit about the technology challenges that you will encounter in a new school year, especially when you run a hybrid model, then I assume there will be a lot of streaming happening out of the school to the households and, and you know, prevent the network from going down, but also making sure if there's like um, the remote model that the teachers have enough bandwidth at their homes and that they have the right equipment to run the classes remotely. Yep. Uh, thanks for your question. I do know that that question has come up and, and we brought up with our tech department. We've hosted some uh, rather large events here that uh, for professional development, cross district professional development with Air Shirley and Harvard where we had a lot of bandwidth under in use. Uh, and uh, when I brought the question up to the tech department about three weeks ago, they were quite confident that uh, we were we would we have sufficient technology upgrade. We made some major improvements uh, in the last couple of years, and they had some foresight to definitely take care of that. Uh, so I've been assured that we're we're good to go with um, being able to do the streaming. Does that answer okay. your question? Question? Yeah, but I, uh, so the second part was, are you supporting your teachers in, in having the right equipment too from when it's all from home? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Our teachers all have MacBooks. Uh, we have an abundance of Chromebooks also available. Uh, and we're looking at getting document cameras for just about every teacher in the building uh, based upon their request. We think that will help facilitate uh, the simultaneous instruction happening, the document camera being able to be positioned as a camera in the room. Uh, and, and under the control of the teacher and focused primarily on the teacher um, as needed. Um, and, you know, we, we feel confident that we'll be able to provision the staff with what they need from an instructional technology point.
point to make to, to make it as optimal as possible for the kids who are remote. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's all the questions, John. You're muted, John. You're muted. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm sorry. I was go, uh, going along there. I've done um, it myself. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so I just want to um, acknowledge the time and the commitment that people have made, the panelists and the folks at home to, to attend tonight's forum. I'm sure many of them went to the previous ones too. Uh, there's a lot of interest. This is the talk of not only the town, it's the talk of every home. Um, so thank you for your participation in, in this uh, forum tonight. I want to also acknowledge though that I did receive emailed questions uh, and rather than um, acknowledge them all right now, I will Keith and I will review them together and we'll reply back with um, the best response we can to the individuals who had emailed us questions. Please keep the questions. If you're at home listening uh, or watching, please feel welcome to submit questions that may have come up tonight and you didn't think of it before, or if you had other questions. We will as a district and as a school uh, be crafting a frequently asked questions document that's in the works and it's actually, I think it's going out relatively soon. It'll probably be a living document because even if it goes out Friday, here are the frequently asked questions we've had based as a district and as a building, it'll be broken down that way. I'm sure there'll be other questions that come up in the following weeks that uh, we didn't even think of that you know are worth answering and worth, certainly worth considering. Uh, so I just wanna acknowledge and thank the folks who have sent me questions and I will be uh, responding to them and we'll be posting a frequently asked questions uh, you know, uh, document fairly soon. Okay. Thanks a lot, for Dorothy, for uh, facilitating this, making it possible. And a shout out to Kirby and LCT, Judy and LCTV. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks you. Thank you.